All right, so now we are going to be in unit four. This is money, banking, and finance. And this is going to be your first section of notes, which is going to talk about the evolution functions and characteristics of money. Now, this says chapter 10. This actually goes along with our um, economics textbook. So just keep that in mind. The bell ringer question, uh, it says, think about how people pay for their purchases other than cash or checks. What are some different payment methods? Are these also forms of money? Explain your reasoning. So think about, for example, Bitcoin. Bitcoin is something that's become popular now. It's a crypto, well, not cryptocurrency, but it is something that is, um, actually it would be cryptocurrency. So it is um, just through the use of the internet. So we have the evolution of money. Uh, before modern economics were in place, the barter economy was common. In this barter economy, moneyless economy, it relied on trade or barter. For example, how could a milkman with a pail of milk obtain a pair of shoes if the cobbler wanted a basket of fish? So the milkman, the only thing that he had to trade was his milk, okay, pails of milk. Now, if he needs a pair of shoes and the cobbler who makes the shoes needs some fish, that means now the milkman is going to have to go find somebody who has fish and see if that person will then trade for some milk. Once he then gets those, those fish, he can then go and get the shoes from the cobbler. Today, our money is managed by the Federal Reserve System or the Fed. The Federal Reserve System is a privately owned, publicly controlled central bank of the United States. If you remember, we talked about the Federal Reserve System under the federal bureaucracy, which is under the executive branch of the United States federal government. The Federal Reserve notes are issued by the Fed. Fed Reserve notes are paper currency issued by the Fed that eventually replaced all other types of federal currency. So into this video, um, we're gonna try to play this video. Hopefully it won't get copyright strike. So watch the video on this slide and answer the following questions in your notes. Number one, keep in mind, this is going to, it's been messed up. So it's just one, two, and three. What are the properties of money? What are the characteristics of money? And what has served as money for most of human history? So I should have this video here. Let's move it over. Here we go. Okay, not that one. We want the other one. Here we go. With Grammarly, you can find really a simple economy with very few goods, people can barter. But when the economy grows, barter trade becomes ineffective. Let me explain this with a simple example. There was a small village by the river. At first, there were only two families. One of them bred rabbits, and the other grew wheat. To diversify their diet, they traded with each other. They agreed that one bag of wheat would be exchangeable for one rabbit. After some time, other families began to settle in the village. Every family produced something else. Some of them produced clothes, others fished, and still others bred cattle. Over time, there were many goods and services. A shoemaker sent his daughter Catherine to get a bag of wheat. The girl took the shoes and went to the farmer to propose a trade. The farmer agreed because he needed shoes, and so they exchanged. The next day, the shoemaker sent Catherine again to get another bag of wheat. But this time the farmer replied, I'm sorry, I don't need a second pair of shoes, but I will give you wheat for a box of apples. So Catherine went to the gardener and proposed to exchange the shoes for some apples. The gardener replied, I never wear shoes in the summer. I won't be needing them for at least six months. I can give you apples in exchange for new horseshoes for my horse, though. So the girl went to the forge, but the blacksmith said that he will give her horseshoes only for a new pair of trousers. Finally, the local seamstress agreed to exchange shoes for trousers. Unfortunately, this wasn't the end. It took Catherine half a day to find someone who needed shoes, but it took another half a day to finally get the wheat that she wanted. It's a little hard to do shopping this way, isn't it? Barter trade is ineffective and time-consuming. People need something that can be used as a medium of exchange, something everyone can accept. They needed money. Money has specific properties. It is a medium of exchange, which allows us to avoid the problems that Catherine had. 
It's also a unit of account and can be used as a measure of costs and revenues through market prices. Here are some characteristics of money that allow it to be used this way. It's durable, which means it should last a long time without breaking. It's homogeneous, which means that each unit should be identical. Portable, so that it's small enough that you can carry it with you. Divisible, so that you can make change. And importantly, it should maintain its value over a long period of time, so your saving would be worth the same even after many years. Throughout human history, there have been many media of exchange, like cattle, salt, or seashells. None of these lasted very long as money. Cattle, for example, wasn't divisible, interchangeable, or easily portable. It also didn't maintain its value over a long period of time. Salt becomes stale over time, so it loses value, and it wasn't homogeneous because one bag of salt could be better quality than another. However, one thing did emerge that had these qualities. Gold and precious metals, which can be minted into coins or bars. Gold can be a medium of exchange and a unit of account. We can count up the number of gold coins something costs. It's durable because it doesn't corrode and it can last a thousand years. It's homogeneous because all one ounce coins are identical and can be marked for purity. Coins are portable too, so a lot of purchasing power can fit in one's pocket. It's divisible because the coins can be different weights. And what's most important, gold has been a very stable store of value because its quantity is limited by nature. Only a small amount of gold is mined each year in comparison to the quantity already in circulation. Because of these properties of gold, it has served as money for most of human history. In modern times, however, the whole world has abandoned the gold standard. We'll see the consequences of this in the next videos. Please subscribe. All right, so the questions, like I said, were what are the properties of money? What are the characteristics of money? And what has served as money for most of human history? So discussion questions, what are some of the advantages or disadvantages of the barter system? And so those are going to come from earlier that we talked about from the video and also that first slide for the evolution of money. So the next one says money in colonial America. For example, I'm sorry, uh, American colonists use both commodity and fiat money. Commodity money is money that has an alternative use as an economic good. For example, there we go. <laughs> Gunpowder, gunpowder was all, always valuable at that point. And then flour, corn, etc. Colonists would consume these products if necessary. They probably would not consume gunpowder, but they would most definitely consume flour or corn because they were over in the colonies, which was the New America, and they probably didn't have a lot of access to food. So tobacco was commonly accepted as commodity money in colonial America. Men, women have always liked to smoke. They had snuff. They have all kinds of things. So tobacco products are always going to be popular. Fiat money, however, is money by government decree. It has no alternative value or use as a commodity. For example, Massachusetts established a monetary value for wampum, a form of currency for the Wampanoag Native Americans made out of white and purple mussel shells. So watch the video on this slide, answer the questions. What is a commodity good? What are some historical examples of commodity money? What is fiat money? And where is commodity money still used or still commonly used? All right, been getting this question a lot recently about the difference between commodity money and fiat money. Basically commodity money has value as a good in addition to its value as a money. So basically anything you would like to use for something other than money, it could be commodity money. So historical examples have been gold, shells, uh, jewelry, arrowheads, Um, perhaps beans or food, as long as they don't spoil too quickly. Those would be examples of commodity money. So if for some reason we didn't want to use that as, com as money anymore, it would still have value as a commodity. However, for fiat money, completely based on your faith. 
So the government tells you that, hey, this is money. So if you look at any dollar bill or five dollar bill, what have you, it will say that that bill must be accepted to satisfy all debts. So the government is making it a requirement that people accept that money to pay off debts. So the government is essentially telling us that it's good. We have faith in the government. We have faith in that money. If the U.S. government were to collapse tomorrow, the dollar wouldn't be worth anything anymore. That piece of paper wouldn't be worth anything. But if we had a commodity money, if we had commodity money, say food or jewelry or gold, and the government collapsed, that money would still be worth its commodity value. Which brings up an interesting historical debate over fiat money backed by commodities. So when we had the gold standard... All right, so that video kind of cut out because we had a power outage. <laughs> Literally all the power went out in the entire school, the internet went out, all of it. So here we are, <laughs> back again. So now we have specie in the colonies. So specie is money in the form of gold or silver coins. You have English shillings, Australian tailors. That's supposed to say Australian. Australian tailors, etc. Coins were the most desirable because they were in limited supply. So now you have triangular trade. We talked about this in ninth and 10th grade history. This occurred between the colonies of Africa and the Caribbean islands. So traders take molasses and pesos from the Caribbean uh, to the colonies. Molasses was then made into rum that was shipped to Africa. And then rum in Africa was traded for enslaved Africans that were then sent to the Caribbean or the colonies. And so this is just explaining the route or the idea of triangular trade. So from tailors to dollars, we had the monetary unit. Unit. This is the standard unit of currency in a country's money supply. Um, the American dollar, the British pound, um, they have the Canadian dollar. So in, uh, for example, in um, Spanish pesos, they were the most popular currency in colonial America because consider we had the conquistadors who colonized um, you know, parts of Central America and South America, and also the, um, what am I trying to say? <laughs> I'm also trying to say the uh, Caribbean, right? So they all kind of used this pesos. Um, this was also called pieces of eight because they were divided into eight parts known as bits. So one Spanish peso equaled eight bits. Pesos resembled Australia's tailors which sounded like dollars in German. This led to our currency in the United States being called the dollar. The US dollar is then um, kind of what we have now. It is divided into tenths rather than eighths like the Spanish. So char characteristics of money. Um, you want money to be portable. For example, it needs to be lightweight, easily transferred from one person to another. It needs to be durable. It needs to be able to um, stay, you know, uh, nice. Okay. It doesn't deteriorate when it's handled. Um, for example, metallic coins and also like a dollar bill, it usually will last about 18 months. And then at that point, the federal reserve will usually take that money, the stuff that's like, you know, beaten up and they will destroy it. And then if they have to, depending on amount of money in circulation, they will print more money. Uh, money also needs to be divisible, so it needs to be divided into smaller units so people can only use as much as they need. For example, if I have five dollars, I can get a dollar <laughs> each of the five dollars. So then if, instead of the five dollar bill, I will have five one dollar bills. So it was divisible. The penny is also um, small enough for almost any purchase, so that's um, you know nice to have in our currency. It also needs to be in limited supply. Money must be available, but in limited supply. Three functions of money. You have a medium of exchange, money or other substance generally accepted as payment for goods and services. One of the three functions of money, for example, you have the exchange of colored shells, tobacco, gold, silver, or salt. Think about salt. Why would that be valuable? Well, throughout history before the refrigerator, you had to have salt in order to cure your meat, which preserved it. Measure of value. One of the three functions of money that allows it to serve as a common denominator uh, to measure value. For example, expressed in dollars and cents. And lastly, money should store value. So one of the three functions of money that allows people to preserve the value for future use. 
Um, if you are only using meat to, you know, as a form of currency, well, obviously meat will expire, which means that once that expires, you have lost its value, has lost your value. So spend your money on something now or wait and spend it later. Money will retain its value depending on if the government says it will. So moving on to this video, um, I don't know if I can get away with showing this. Let's see if it'll work because this one is, um, this one is kind of a, uh, a bigger name. Let's see if I can get away with this one. Before we talk about the answer to this question, let's make sure you know a few things about money. In today's world, money is how people pay for things. Duh. Money can be absolutely anything that does these three functions. The first one is a medium of exchange. Money is anything that people are willing to accept for payments. I'll give you an example. Several years ago, I printed out and gave to my students Clifford money. Take a look. Now, each dollar could be used for a bonus point on the exam. Students in my class started buying things from each other using Clifford dollars. Hey man, I'll buy that soda off you for a Clifford dollar. The point is that money, real money, has value because we're willing to accept it. The second function of money is the idea of a unit of account. So if I told you that car is worth $500, that gives you information. A car that's worth $50,000 is obviously gonna be different. So money helps measure the relative value of different goods and different services. The last function is the idea of a store of value. Money allows you to save and store the value of your work and effort. So if you did some work for someone and you got paid in meals, there's no way to actually store that value. But getting paid money allows you to store that value to buy something in the future. What do you think inflation does to store value? Well, it diminishes it. That's why the answer is not C. But wait, there's two more things I want to talk about. It's the difference between fiat money and commodity money. Commodity money, like gold and cigarettes, has some sort of intrinsic value. You can do something else with it. Fiat money, like currency, has no other value. You can't do anything else with it. Okay, there's no country in the world that's still on something called the gold standard. In other words, the amount of money that you have doesn't represent a certain amount of gold that the government owes you. So that means if you take a $20 bill and give it to a government and say, hey, take this, I don't want it, give me something else that's worth $20, they'll give you back a $20 bill. So that's why the answer is B. Commodity money is used less than fiat money today. Okay. So that was a quick video. So that was, uh, what does inflation do to store a value? And what is the difference between commodity money and fiat money? So the next question, it says, watch the video and then uh, write the three main ideas from the video in your notes. So I will go to that one. This is the basics of modern money. Excellent schools, support for our veterans, medical research, upgraded infrastructure. Imagine if we could afford all these things. Well. We actually can. But somewhere along the way, we forgot the true power of our currency. We invented the US dollar so we could unleash the full potential of our nation, of our people, of our land, and of our economy, to achieve our greatest aspirations. You see, the United States is a currency issuer. Currency issuers are completely different than currency users. This distinction is a really big deal. Cities, businesses, and households like yours and mine are all currency users. Our federal government is not. Currency issuers are unique. They should not behave like currency users. If you can grasp that, you're already further along than most of our politicians. Currency is our government's money. Only the U.S. government can create our nation's currency. Many countries work this way, but not those like Greece, which gave up their national currency. Not all money is created by the government. Banks, credit card companies, and other institutions also create money each time they issue credit or loan. We call bank money credit to distinguish it from currency. Most of the money in our economy is bank credit, but credit is not the same as currency. Currency plays a unique and important role in our economy. As a nation, we dream big about how to make life better for our citizens and communities. Unlike you and I, who have to earn or borrow money to spend it, we gave our government the exclusive power to issue the national currency. Every time our government spends, it creates currency, usually just by adding numbers to bank accounts on a computer. And when it taxes, it removes some of its currency by subtracting those numbers. It's a bit like keeping score. Adding and subtracting currency to various accounts is like adding and deleting points in a computer game. So our government can't run out of its currency any more than a computer can run out of numbers to add and it never needs to get points before it can add more. Now you may be wondering, if the government can just issue currency with a computer, why would anyone accept it as payment for anything? 
Why would it have any value at all? Well, this is where we discover why we have taxes. Federal taxes can only be paid with the government's currency. In order to pay our taxes and stay in Uncle Sam's good graces, we have to first get its currency. By requiring that we return that currency to pay our taxes, the government creates continual demand for the currency it alone issues. Now, because some people, including many of our politicians, don't understand the difference between currency issuers and currency users, they think Uncle Sam needs our tax money to pay for spending. But it's actually the other way around. The government spending gives us the currency we need to pay our taxes. So those taxes simply remove from the economy some of the currency which was already issued by the federal government. This helps our economy stay in a healthy balance. One of the biggest responsibilities of the currency issuer is to make sure it isn't causing unemployment or inflation by taxing or spending too much or too little. The really powerful part about all this is that not only can currency issuers like the US never go broke, but they can also always afford whatever they're authorized to do. But if the government doesn't need money from external sources to fund that spending, what's with all this fear about the national debt? Don't we owe China a kajillion dollars or something? Aren't we worried they'll stop buying our government bonds? Well, not really. Think about it. How can we borrow US dollars from China when all US dollars are made in the USA? You see, China gets their US currency through trade. They send us stuff and we pay them with currency, which they, along with many other countries, like to save. We like to save currency too. US government bonds are actually just big savings accounts a really safe way to hold currency that's already been spent into existence. So that big scary sounding number that's commonly called the national debt is actually just a record of all the savings of US dollars since our country began. All the currency that's been spent into the economy and not yet taxed back. That's nothing to fear. You probably noticed that our government is almost always adding more currency into our economy than it takes out in taxes. We call this a government deficit, but it's actually a completely normal and necessary response to people saving its currency. You see, our capitalist economy is dependent on sales growth. Money that's being stashed away or spent overseas isn't being spent on the goods we produce here at home. When US sales fall, our employers have less income and they're eventually forced to cut production and jobs. As the sole issuer of our currency, the government plays a vital role in helping our economy keep growing. We decide what we want our government paying for, and that sets the amount of currency it creates via spending. The government should then adjust the amount it removes via taxation to just enough so our economy stays at full employment and avoids inflation. In other words, Congress is supposed to manage the currency to balance the economy. Freeing our government from senseless limitations like debt ceilings and balancing the budget enables it to use its sovereign currency powers to accomplish the real and serious tasks for which it was formed in the first place. Tasks like putting available resources to work on our infrastructure, investing in the health and education of our people, ensuring our safety and well-being, ending unemployment and keeping our economy growing, taking care of our retired, our sick, our hungry, our poor, our huddled masses. Sound familiar? As we rediscover the power of our sovereign currency, let's hold our government accountable to use it wisely for our nation's prosperity and for the well-being of all its citizens. All right. So, components of modern money. Um, there are several types of modern money. You have Federal Reserve notes, which are paper bills and metallic coins. Uh, you have demand deposit accounts, account whose fund can be removed from a bank or other financial institution by writing a check or using a debit card. So there's two major different types. Um, the M1 measure, that's when you think of like your checking account. So that means that you would take money out in the form of currency, coins, checks, demand deposits, or traveler's checks. That's an M1 measure. Now your M2 measure, that's going to be kind of like your savings account. So that says broad definition of money supply conforming to money's role as a medium exchange and a store of value. So your savings account, typically when you open a savings account, it's because you were trying to let your money gain value over time. 
So that includes savings deposits, time deposits, and money market funds. And that is the rest of section one. And that sort of thing. But that doesn't happen.